the state exists to preserve the relationship between people and their stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you create something of value and someone tries to take that from you, recourse to the state is how you resolve that. So we've outsourced the defense of our property effectively. And at its best, a nation state wields political power, and I'm going to get into what political power means shortly, to defend the market process from interruption. So you mm -hmm. want people to be maximally free, and to be maximally free, you need strong property, right? You need an integrity of the relationship between you and your stuff so that you can engage in the process of a consensual exchange, mm -hmm. increase the division of labor, increase wealth, mm -hmm. and therefore increase the collective physical power harnessed by human beings in the marketplace, right? So it's this... And we as we talked about last time, I framed this as useful ideas a lot. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same thing. It's more useful ideas are implemented, whether it's property, whether it's uh, an iPhone or a laptop. These are just better ideas for communicating or accomplishing mm -hmm. human purpose that gives you more movement and more wealth creation. So that's what the state acts as like this insulating layer to prevent that from being attacked. Mm -hmm. But we've been trapped in this situation with the state for a long time that mm -hmm. it tends to start to prey on the very thing it's supposed to protect over time, which mm -hmm. has been a real problem. When you start to kind of unpack uh, the division of labor and uh, a lot of these pieces, it feels like the sum of it, the parts are more valuable than them mm -hmm. individually. But also, when you then overlay things like property rights, you then are able to do something very different because actually property rights usually are thought of as defense. Uh -huh. So you cannot take my property. But in some way, it's also a uh, tailwind to give people more conviction to specialize. Yes. So when you think of the farm, why did you have the ability to get water, food, and all the things you needed for you and your family to survive? Because you had no confidence that anyone else was coming to save uh -huh. you, right? Uh -huh. Now, when you move to modern society, I don't think that I know very many people who have a farm uh -huh. because they have greater confidence that the food supply, whether you like it or not, or yes. think it's good or, or it could be improved or whatever, will provide food. And so they have the confidence to not have to go spend time on farming because they say somebody else in our society has taken on that division of labor. Yep. And I am going to go specialize in whatever, whether it's a white collar job, a blue collar job or anything in between. And so property rights not only protect what you're doing, but it gives you the confidence to become more and more and more specialized yes. and still have the safety net of society that says, yes, food will be at the grocery store. Yes. Whether you have property rights or not, if at any point your confidence that food will be at the grocery store or clean water is going to be there or any of these things that you don't specialize in, if that ever breaks down, that's when all hell breaks loose. And we return back to a world where no one had confidence and they had to be self-sufficient. And there's just not a lot of people that are prepared to do that. Today. Yeah, yeah, that would be the collapse of the division of labor, yes. the collapse of wealth creation, which is equivalent to the collapse of civilization. Yes, it's like I hammer this point so hard. People, it's, wealth is demonized a lot. Mm -hmm. Wealth is should not be demonized. It's the basis of the solution to most problems, mm -hmm. I would argue. And I think that point you made is so good because what does that mean? Right, confidence in property rights. Mm -hmm. That means other people are engaging in this symbolic structure, playing this imaginal game with you, mm -hmm. and it's the confidence you have that they'll continue to honor the rules of the game, as mm -hmm. will you. Now, if confidence is shaken for any reason, it it unwinds the whole thing. The whole mm -hmm. thing goes in, involuted. If you really think about uh, laws, right, and you were to overlay it with the imaginary game that kids play, mm -hmm. the changing of a law is no different than the five kids out in the backyard being like, okay, now uh, that used to be out of bounds. Now it's not out of bounds right. anymore. And then people start running over there and the game continues. Yes. Like that is the exact equivalent of legislation and laws and like all these things that grownups – are playing, yes. but also uh, laws and human nature uh, are at sometimes at odds. Mm, yes. But the beauty of good laws 
is that it is able to use human nature as uh, and align those incentives so that humans will do what humans are going to do, uh, but do it within some agreed upon uh, framework. Yes. And so, you know, I always go back to like, if there was no laws, would most people go out in the streets and start killing people? Probably not. Right. But if there was no food in a city and families were going hungry, it doesn't matter if there's laws or not. At some point, right? I think there's a saying like, uh, uh, you really see what a man is capable of if, uh, if he doesn't eat for three days. Mm, yeah. Right? right? And so it's almost like the laws have to align with the human nature because you can't have people – like the laws don't matter if people are hungry. Yeah. The laws don't matter if people feel like uh, their life's in danger. Yeah. And you actually see this in society. Like thou shall not kill is written into law. Yes. Yeah, Except exactly. for if he's going to kill you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you can, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, like it's a very weird way to look at it, but in some way the law and human nature do have to align or therefore society eventually rejects the law. Uh, 100%. So much good stuff there. Um, Peterson, again, this idea that what you just said, Thou shalt not kill is written mm -hmm. directly into the law. Mm -hmm. There is a mythological substructure mm -hmm. to Western civilization. A lot of it is the Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. mythology, mm -hmm. right? We, we would not have gotten to property rights if we did not have thou shalt not kill mm -hmm. in our history. Like that's another important, it's, a, it's almost like the blockchain of the imaginal structure, mm -hmm. right? It, it's building in layers over time. We didn't just decide out of the blue that we're going to create the United States. I mean, read the Federalist Peppers, yes. Papers. These guys were diehard Christian, or at least inspired by the Bible to a large mm -hmm. extent. And what you said too, like good laws map onto good incentives. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that people don't really follow laws, actually. People follow incentives. Mm -hmm. Right now, if there's, a, if there's a credible threat of force behind a law, then that's a disincentive to break it. Mm -hmm. So you might follow it for some period of time, but ultimately people are going to bend to their own incentives. Mm -hmm. And the point with the kids, the kids, hey, that's out of bounds. Now that's out of bounds. Mm -hmm. What do you think we're doing with national borders? Yes. We're, that's it. This is, this is your country. This is my country. And there's layers to it. Like there's national borders. But even if you think of like voting districts, mm -hmm. like that's the one that always cracks me up, right? Is that like you ever seen them drawn and it looks like a square and then in one corner it like reaches out and grabs like a city, <laughs> right? And comes back. And you're like, if I was just to come up with a random voting city or voting district, that's not the shape that I would draw, yeah. <laughs> right? Now, it may be for good reason or bad reason or whatever, right? And people love to debate that stuff. But like that is the drawing of imaginary lines that then feed into a game that is around voting. Yes. That then dictates who gets to play what role in the game. Who benefits from the proceeds stolen from taxation and inflation. That's mm -hmm. what that game is, right? Mm -hmm. You get voted in office and then you get to decide what to do with the stolen booty. Mm -hmm. um, so it, again, we needed to play that game because we needed to – create integrity of relationship between people and their stuff in the physical world. But the problem with that game is that monopolist on violence, the security provider over time has tended to start to bend the rules to their own favor. The individuals that come into power inside of the state have tended to corrupt the state. And we'll, we'll get into corruption a bit later, but and and I th I also think uh, a key piece is, is that's part of the division of labor, mm -hmm. which people tend to forget yeah. of like, if you go back you know, 200 years, like guess who protected your home? Mm -hmm. You better. Right. Right. Because yes. if you didn't or you and your you know equivalent of a neighborhood did yeah. not, you were fucked. Yes. And so at some point, the farmer said, okay, this other person is going to be the farmer and going to provide food for the village. Mm -hmm. And this other person is going to provide the security. Mm -hmm. This other person is going to provide, you know, whatever, uh, the horses or, or whatever the division of labor ended up being. But you had to have the confidence, mm -hmm. not only in that the property rights job. and all this, but they would do their job. Yeah. Because uh, the fastest way for people to get really interested in self-defense <laughs> is to look <laughs> at a group of people and say, you can't protect me. Yeah. Right. And, and you see this actually the, the place where unfortunately we see it is look at natural disasters. 
natural disasters come in and it breaks down so many of the agreed upon uh, uh, kind of structures of a society. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if you go back to Hurricane Katrina in uh, um, maybe a decade ago or so mm -hmm. now, uh, I remember that there was, uh, the National Guard was being called in. Yeah. And literally you had armed National Guard men uh, and women who were patrolling Walmart yeah. because Walmart was selling their physical goods and they were keeping the money in the back because there was no armored trucks to come pick it up. Right. <laughs> like you start to say, okay, hold on a second. Did Walmart call? <laughs> right, right. Did an individual in the community, did the governor? Like, I, I don't know how it happened, but the reason why we don't have armed soldiers in every single store is because there's a general belief that the local police, the security systems, yes. the technology, all this stuff can protect the goods and the store owner. Yes. When that breaks down, it goes back to get armed men here. 100%.